Okay, so we have an answer. Here is our OV. What do we need to do with our OV? We need to take our OV and compare it to a CV, a critical value, right? When our OV is bigger than our CV, that means our result, our answer, is significant. That's how we abbreviate significance. We use an asterisk or a star, right? If, though, the OV is not more extreme than the CV, then our results are non-significant. And that's how we abbreviate non-significance, NS. Why don't we use an S for significance? Because we're already using S for the standard deviation. That's why we use the asterisk or the star, okay? Jose, how do I look up a critical value? Well, let me remind you of something. Our answer, 2.005, what it's actually doing is it's making an area, right? We have a normal curve, right? Here is our answer, here's zero. Here is our answer, 2.005. Our answer is making an area, right? The size of this area is what we call P. What we're really doing is we're comparing the size of the area that our answer makes against an area that we consider decisive. We call that area alpha. So what's happening? As our answer gets bigger, the area that it makes gets smaller. So when the OV is more extreme than the critical value, let's pretend that our critical value, and I'll do it here in blue, is like the number three, right? When our answer is less extreme than the number three, when the distance from zero to two is smaller than the distance from zero to three, then the area that our answer makes is smaller than the area that the critical value number three is making, right? This area is called alpha. So when our OV is less extreme than the CV, that means that P, the area that P makes, is bigger than the area alpha makes, right? The black area, which is from here all the way to infinity, right? That area is bigger than the area that alpha is making, that the critical value is making, right? Which is basically the same area minus this part right here. So in this case, when this number is smaller than that number, this area is bigger than that area. If I see either one of these things, if I see that my answer is less than the critical value, or I see that P is bigger than alpha, my test results are non-significant. Well, this is completely the opposite of what's going on here. When my answer crosses over the critical value, so let's say the critical value was the number 1.65, right? So let me do that here, all right? Let me do that in a different color so we don't get mixed up. I'm gonna do this in purple, right? It's purple. Let's pretend this is 1.65. Now P makes this purple area which is from 1.65 to positive infinity. Now this is P. P is this whole area, right? Now alpha is still three over here, right? Now, right, right? Oops, what did I do? No, remember, if 1.65, I'm sorry, if 1.65 is the critical value Right? Then the answer, then the size of the area that is making, this is alpha, sorry. This is alpha, right? Now look what's happening. Now, because my answer, the OV, right, 2.005 is greater than the critical value of 1.65, now P is smaller than alpha. So the opposite is going on here. Right, P now is smaller than alpha. When I see either one of these things, I automatically know that my 
answer is significant. Now look, how can I remember this? Well, it's real simple. I'll teach you a mnemonic. Right? I always have mnemonics for these things. Right? Stick up two peace signs. Right? And now I'll go like this. Right? Whatever is happening here, the opposite is always happening here. Switch them. Whatever is happening here, the opposite is always going on here. So if the OV is more extreme than the CV, P is smaller than alpha. If the OV is not more extreme than the CV, P is greater than alpha, right? They're always in opposite directions, these signs. So how do I remember which one goes with which, Jose? Well, alpha starts with A. A is closer to the letter C, and O is closer to the letter P. P is the size of the area that the OV makes. Alpha is one of the things that we use to look up what the CV is. So I have to tell, teach you, I have to show you how to look up the critical value. So let me erase this part right here and I'll go to the next slide. All right. We want to fill out this table here for practice. When you do this for real, you only look up one critical value, right? If we were looking for a difference, if we were looking for any difference, that would be a non-directional research hypothesis, which would require a two-tailed test, right? And if we were doing this for real, we would be using an alpha at 5%, right? This would be our starting guideline, right? We can always make alpha smaller, we can never make it bigger. So let's fill this out. How do I fill this out? Well, I'm going to need to use the table in the back of the book. So let's turn to page, we're on page 400 and, hold on, page 402. The instructions for table B, let me go ahead and move in closer so I can show you, are on page 402. But I want to show you how to use the table. So we're going to go here to table B2. The T values needed for the rejection of the null hypothesis. Let's take a look. There are two sets of columns. There's a set of columns for a one-tailed test and a two-tailed test. Underneath those headings is 10%, 0.10, 5%, 0.05, 5%, 0.05 and 1%, 0.01. And again, they're same here. And then the other thing I need to know is the degrees of freedom. So how do I look up a critical value? You look it up like this. There are three things you need to know to find T star, the critical value for T. The first thing you have to decide is what is the alpha that I'm going to use? You're going to make alpha 0.05, right? I'm sorry. Whoops, made a mistake. The first thing we want to know is, is the research hypothesis directional or non-directional? Is it a one-tailed test or is it a two-tailed test? In other words, how many tails am I going to be using to find the critical value? The second thing we need to know is, what is the size of alpha, all right? Until further notice, the answer to this is always going to be 0.05 or 5%. And the third thing we need to know is what is our degrees of freedom, right? What did I tell you it is? It's our total sample size, right? Our total sample size, N1 plus N2 minus the number of groups, minus two. Where did we get that answer? We got the answer from this part of the formula right here. So for this problem, our degrees of freedom is nine. So using the book, one more time, using the book, let's fill out these four squares. So here's my book. Let's see, what do I need to know first? Is it one tail or two tails? So let me do the first column, one tail, 
at 5% with 9 degrees of freedom, the answer is 1.833. All right? 1.833. Let me use the black marker. The blue one's not very bright. 1.833. Oh, now it's starting to look sloppy. All right, let's try it again. 1.833. All right. According to the textbook, if I make alpha smaller, I'm making it 1%. Let me go back over here again show you the textbook. One tailed, alpha is 1%. I'm gonna go down to nine degrees of freedom. And the answer is 2.822. 2.822. Now let me look up the answers for the two tail test. One more time, here's my textbook. Two tails, 5%, nine degrees of freedom. The answer is 2.262. 2.262, again, notice that all these critical values have three decimal places. That's why my answer needs to have three decimal places so I can compare apples to apples. And then lastly, the two-tail test at 1% with nine degrees of freedom is 3.250. So look, when I do this for real, I only need to look up one and only one critical value. So which is the one that I would look up? If I'm only looking for a difference, that would be a non-directional research hypothesis. It would be a two-tailed test, all right? What am I gonna use for alpha? Until further notice, I'm going to use 5%. What were my degrees of freedom? My degrees of freedom, right, was nine. So that's how I got these three numbers. So the one thing that satisfies these three questions, right, 5% two-tailed is right here. I'm gonna compare this answer, this critical value, against the answer that I got from my problem, 2.005. So I'm gonna compare it. Here's 2.005. I'm gonna compare it against 2.262. And I'm gonna look, what's happening here? The OB is less than the CV. The OB is less than the CV. So my answer is non-significant, right? Okay, let's do that to all of them, just to make sure. If the observed value, if the OB is 2.005, and the CV is 1.833, here my answer is bigger than that. So had this been the test, my answer here would have been significant. My answer is 2.005 and the critical value was 2.822. Here the answer would have been non-significant. And once again, my answer is 2.005 and the critical value is 3.25. Here my answer would have been non-significant. Let me show you, there's a pattern here. As my answer goes from one tail to two tail, right? As my critical value, sorry. My critical values go from one tail to two tails. Did the numbers get bigger? Did they get smaller or did they stay the same? The answers got bigger. That means the test got harder. So a two tail test is always harder than a one tail test. Let's take a look at the 5% critical values versus the 1% critical values. As alpha, as alpha got smaller, right, when alpha equals 0 0.05, when alpha equals 0 0.01, look at the numbers. We have 1.833 and 2.262 at 5%. We have 2.822 and 3.250 at 1%. As our answers, as our critical values go from 5% to 
to 1%. Did the numbers get bigger? Did they get smaller or did they stay the same? They got bigger. So a 1% test is harder than a 5% test. So when I combine all this information, this is the easiest test, right? Let me write easiest underneath, easiest, right? And this would have been the hardest test, right? Remember, our answer doesn't change. It's what we're comparing it against. Right? If we want to make the test hard, right, we use a smaller alpha. If we don't know the direction of the difference, if we have a non-directional research hypothesis, we have to do a two-tailed test because the answer, we don't know if it could be positive or negative, right? What if my answer would have been negative, Jose? Wouldn't it have been smaller than all of these? No, because remember, we want to know which answer is more extreme. So we would have to take our answer and take the absolute value of it to see if it's farther away from zero. All right. Let me erase all this, and I'll show you the next slide, and I'll review some ideas. I'll leave this part out. And I'll leave that part up for right now. <clears throat> so, look, it's the same numbers that I just found. Jose, why is this one in red? Because this is the actual critical value that I'm using. Why? I did a two-tailed test, I was looking for a difference. How did I know that I was looking for a difference? Because way back, the very beginning, I said, look, here's my question, is there a difference? That was my research question. So I was looking for any difference. I did not predict that one group was gonna score higher than the other. So that would have been a non-directional research. So, there it is. That's why this is the one and only critical value I would look up if I were doing this for real. Then why did you make us look up four, Jose? Why? To show you the pattern. A two-tailed test is always harder than a one-tailed test. And 1% 1 is always harder than 5%. 